There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. For the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Amen. You may be seated. For the eternal God is your refuge. Not only is he your refuge, he is my refuge. And the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Just for a little while today, I, I want to talk from the subjects and just say to us all, safe in his arms. Safe in his arms. And I believe I want to put a, a subtopic there and just talk about the God of the bottom. The God of the bottom. This passage of scripture contains one of the most comforting promises in all the Bible. Underneath, Sister Denise, are the everlasting arms. Sometimes we feel that we are in a free fall, heading rapidly toward a hard landing. I think about in the first uh, Superman movie starring Christopher Reeves, Lois Lane, she is falling from a, a tall building. And out of nowhere, Superman, he swoops down and he grabs her and says, don't worry, I got you. Right. To which she replies, yeah, but who has you? Uh, the arms uh, of God, the Bible says, are underneath his people. God holds up everything in the universe. And unlike Superman, he doesn't need anyone to hold him up. <coughs> But on one hand, this chapter is a very encouraging chapter, but then on the other hand, it's a very depressing chapter. It's encouraging because it's the Holy Writ written by the Holy Spirit, and it tells the story of God's awesome power and how Yahweh helps his children in spite of our wayward behavior. But the gloom we find in this chapter is associated with the fact that Moses is getting ready to converse with the children of Israel for the last time. He speaks to them, number one, knowing that the people that he led in the wilderness have all now died, and they have died in disobedience, and God, because of their disobedience, would not let them into the promised land. We all know the story. But God did not mix words and did not sugarcoat his words that he ascribes to his people. He calls them stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. And because of their apostasy, God shared with them that they would not enter into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. This land would not be enjoyed by them. But instead, their children will now be the ones who will enter the land that's flowing with milk and honey. Right. The land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. We know that Moses, he knew his audience. He knew that he was speaking to the sons and daughters of, of those that had been disobedient. So now he's preparing them for the land of promise. As Moses, as he speaks, I can only imagine, Sister Butler, how he must have felt knowing that the curtain of his own mortality was uh, about to fall, knowing that he was about to really, in essence, catch a cloud up out of here. But despite all of that, despite his pending demise, he, he must now speak a word of hope. You know, sometimes, even in our, our, our deepest uh, despair, we still must speak a word of hope. Amen. And on the heels of hope, he must now speak a word of challenge to these sons and daughters of these disobedient people that they would go into the promised land not making the same mistakes that their forefathers had made. So Moses, he, he begins to speak to 
to, to all the 12 tribes of Jacob as he brings his announcement to the 12 tribes of Israel to a close. Uh, he speaks of God who, who, who lives in the heavens, but, but also the one who abides in the clouds. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, he says in verse 26, who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. But even though God lives in the heavens and abides in the clouds, he is the God that always helps his people. Amen. Then he utters these words. He says, the eternal God is your refuge, but underneath are the everlasting arms. Right. What a moving and poignant word that fell from the lips of, of Moses to the progeny of this disobedient mothers and fathers uh, right before the children were about to enter the promised land. You know, I know that all of us know that God all throughout the Bible is historically the God who has always done great things on the mountaintops. I would hope that all of us have a high and an exalted view of God that's here this morning. He dwells in high places. Amen. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 that he was caught up to the third heaven, and that's God's abode. It was on a mountain called Horeb that God first spoke to Moses, telling him in Exodus 3 and 5, he said, take off your shoes, for the ground upon which you are standing is holy ground. But even before God spoke to Moses that day up at a burning bush, Moses saw something that, that dumbfounded him. He, he saw this bush that, that burned, but it would, it would never go out. It would never be consumed up on this mountain. I really believe in my sanctified imagination that early in the morning he passed this bush, Sister Nita, and, and the bush was burning, and on the way home uh, at lunch it was still burning. In the evening it was still burning, but it would not be consumed. But that was up on a mountain. There was another mountain in Moses' life uh, called Mount Sinai where God gave him the Ten Commandments. God, he moved uh, in a mighty way up on Mount Carmel when Elijah defied the 450 prophets of Baal and, and then slayed those very prophets. God dwells in high places. There was a mount called Mount Hermon, or the mount we call the Mount of Transfiguration where, where Jesus was transfigured right in the middle of Moses and Elijah and where God said on the second occasion, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But the greatest of all mountains in scripture is the, is the mountain that we encounter in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John called Calvary. It was up on that mount that my Savior and your Redeemer, he, he died for the sins of the world on one dark Friday. He shed his blood. It was on that mount that he shed his blood for, for our redemption and sanctification. Oh, you act like... <laughs> Uh, you didn't just hear what I said. If it were not for uh, that mountain, we would not have the privilege to come in here and sing Amazing Grace on today. You would not have a song in your heart. If it were not for that mountain, we would not be able to sing what can wash away my sin, what can make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Mountains are of the utmost significance in the life of Scripture, in the mind of God, and in the heart of God's people. But in this text, Moses said that the eternal God is your refuge. For God is our refuge and our strength, according to Psalm 46. But underneath are the everlasting arms. That word underneath, in the Hebrew, it means the bottom. So the text could really read, the eternal God is my refuge, and at the bottom are his everlasting arms. Uh, how low is that? I can hear someone saying, how low is that? However low you can go as a Christian, God is there. You steal from your mama, that's low. 
But God is there. You, you abandon your wife and your kids, that's low, but, but God is there. You, 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 you don't just cheat one time uh, and commit adultery, but you're in a long-standing relationship. That's low, but God is still there. God is at the bottom. When you hit rock bottom, that's God. He's there. God is not just the God on the mountain, but he's also God of the valley. He's not just God at the top, but he's also God at the bottom. Somebody came in here today and you are you're at your bottom. I just want you to know that God is there. The great British pastor C.H. Spurgeon said, you cannot go so low but that God's arms of love are lower still. You can, you, can, you can get poor and poor, but underneath are his everlasting arms. You can get older and feebler, but your ears are failing, your eyes are, are, are growing dim, but underneath are the everlasting arms. He said, by and by, unless the rapture takes place, you and I will have to die, and you will come down, and I will come down very low. But it's still true, underneath are the everlasting arms of God. We need to learn to trust God when the pits of life come. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Brother Antoine, the Bible says in Psalm 37, verses 23 and 4, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. But though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I'm glad to report to you that God is not just the God of, of high places, but he's also the God of low places. That's why you've been giving him praise and glory on today, because you know that even when you reach life's bottom, Underneath are his everlasting arms. Underneath. I, I don't care how low you go. It doesn't matter. God is right there. Tara, Tara, I, I, I know, I, I know, but, but today I'm giving 20 people permission to turn to their neighbor and say at my lowest point, God was right there. You can give God a shout for, for when you was at the bottom because he is the God of the bottom. Matter of fact, God found me at the bottom, at the bottom of that hill down there on 21st and, and Kelly. And God picked me up. He turned me around and he placed my feet on solid ground. I, I got to give him praise. I got to give him honor. I got to give him glory for he is the God of the bottom. Some of your thoughts have become audible and you're saying, what does it mean, preacher, when you define him as the God of the bottom? I know about the God of, uh, of the mountaintop, uh, the high places, but what made you and Moses define him yeah. in the terminology as the God of the bottom? First of all, he's the God of the bottom because he always does what no other can do. Preach, Scobie. I think I will today. Look, look at what he did in the life of Moses, which is also what he did in the life of Israel. He did what no other could do. Down in Egypt land, when Pharaoh commanded that, that, that the Jews make bricks out of straw, God showed up and did what nobody else can do. The more they were oppressed, the Bible says, the more they multiplied. And, and what should have destroyed them made them stronger. Let me make it uh, personalized for you. What should have killed you made you stronger. Somebody ought to say thank you today. But God did what... What nobody else could do in the life of Moses. 
when the time came that Jochebed was pregnant with Moses, there went out this edict by the Pharaoh that all male Jewish babies that were born were to be killed. And, and Jochebed and her husband Amron, they decided against allowing their little brown baby to be aborted. She gave birth and then put him in a floating cradle, placed him uh, in the Nile. And Miriam, the older sister of Moses, she navigated this little floating cradle so that the baby would, uh, who was destined to become the liberator of Egypt would be safe. And God has assigned a destiny to your life, to my life, that can't no devil in hell uh, keep you from your destiny. You don't believe me? Well... Think of every trick that the devil has played in your life, that he's tried to keep you from your destiny, and it has come to naught, all of his tricks. But look at what happened. Moses, in his floating cradle, ends up in the bathing pool of Pharaoh's daughter. And immediately she falls in love with this little brown baby that she found floating in the in the river. All right. And God made Pharaoh to be Moses' foster grandfather. He made the enemy feed him. He made the enemy clothe him. He made the enemy educate him so that when he grew up, he would be the liberator and know the Egyptian ways. It's no secret to what God can do. What he has done for others, he can do for you. He's the God of the bottom because he can do what no other can do. But not only is he the God of the bottom who does what no other can do, he is the God of the bottom because he meets me in my mess. He meets me. He doesn't abandon me in my mess. Some of you would abandon me in my mess. But God does not. He meets me in my mess. And sometimes, Sister Angela, our mess is putrid. You don't hear me? I'm talking about dog food kind of funky. That's what I'm saying. I'm only talking to the real people today. I mean, sometimes our mess is real stinky. Anybody in here today ever been in a mess? I'm talking about stink bait kind of mess, not dough bait kind of mess. I got any fishermen in here. You know, dough bait, it stinks, but 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 dough bait don't stink like stink bait. Hey, come on, talk about it. I, I mean, have you ever been in a mess? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it smells so bad that that everybody you knew and loved left you except the God of the bottom. I remember when the daughter of Pharaoh drew. The baby Moses from her bathing pool, she recognized the color of his skin, that he was a, a Jew, and she knew that their ethnicity was different. Therefore, her milk as an Egyptian, it was insufficient for this little brown baby. But Miriam says, I know that you cannot nurse the, the child, but I know a Hebrew woman who can be the baby's nanny, and God orchestrated uh, Moses' yeah. destiny. That's why you can never afford to put your life in your hands. You got to let God navigate your life. In my sanctified imagination, Sister Boston, I believe when Jochebed was nursing Moses in his infancy, and even though he was about to be raised in Egypt, uh, Jochebed was speaking Hebraic tongue. And, and all the time she was stroking her little baby's uh, head, uh, reminding him, you ain't no Egyptian. Don't you fall in love with this culture. You got to remember who you are. I'm your mama. I'm Jochebed. Your daddy's name is Amron. And you have a brother named Aaron. And you've got a sister named Miriam. All this time she's stroking his head, reminding him of his heritage. Reminding him that even though he will grow up in an Egyptian palace, he's still a Jew. Now, all the time she's reminding him, don't forget where you have come from. Uh, that's what a lot of you have done. You've forgotten where you have come from. You've hung up your harps of amen and hallelujah. 
You've gotten too contemporary with the things that you do. You have left the church. And I know, I know, I know, but I'm going to say it anyway. Many of y'all, you've left the black church. Let me just say it the way I want to say it. We love everybody, black, white. Indian, Hispanic, uh, uh, Asian, we love everybody, but there's a certain culture that, 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 that we uh, understand. And many, you have left your heritage. And let me tell you something. I ain't going to tell you today. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You know, you go out yonder, you go all these places. But then somebody in your family, they die. And all of a sudden you want to be right here. I got to be real careful because it, it seems like stuff I say, people take it out of context. I know my brother Pecola is not. Pecola, you know I ain't talking about you and your brother and all that. I'm talking about folks that went out to those churches, but then they want to come back to the black church and have the home going service. You, 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 you've forgotten your culture, but when all hell breaks loose, somewhere or another, you remember your culture. You've hung up your harps. You got to remember all. Nobody else is going to understand all that that your culture has gone through. But for 40 years, Moses, he grows up in the Egyptian palace. And then one day he kills an Egyptian and he buries his body in, a, in the sand. And he thinks nobody has saw this until the next day he sees two Jews fighting. And they say to him when he tried to step in, man, who made you judge? And from that moment on, he's no longer the young prince in Egypt. But now he becomes a fugitive from justice. For 40 years, Pharaoh, I want you to hear me now, had raised Moses as his foster grandchild. But never forgot that he was a Jew. The minute that Moses kills an Egyptian, his grandfather turns on him. And his grandfather, who raised him as his own for 40 years, now wants to kill him. All I'm trying to say is whenever you get in a mess, genuine friends will show up. And your enemies who have been parading around for months, years, maybe even decades will start unzipping their sheep's costumes and, and their true selves will come out. You ain't got to say amen. Just keep on living. Keep on living. All it takes is one mistake. All it takes is one failure. And you'll discover who your true friends are. Just one. Just one. And, and, and folks that you thought were with you will show you they were never with you. Jesus says that even though your mother and father forsake you, the Lord, the God of the bottom, will stand with you in your mess. Abraham was a liar, but God stood with him. Uh, Jacob was deceitful, uh, but God stood with him. Uh, Samson, he violated his Nazarite vow, but God stood with him. David, he coveted another man's wife and, and killed that, that man, uh, that man and, and, and God still stood with him. Paul was responsible for, for the death of countless Christians, but God stood with him. Peter denied him three times, but God stood with him. Now, what did you do? Come on, Come on. Come on. Reverend Burris, they didn't hear me. Stay with you. I say with all of these horrible things these yeah. men in the Bible did. God stood with him. And my question to all of you today is, what did you do that you think God won't stand with right. you? Right. Right. If I confess my sins, he is faithful. And he's ready to forgive us of all of our sins and, and cleanse me. 
Are there any cleansed folks this morning? Am I all by myself? First John 1 and 9, if I confess my, my sins unto him, he is faithful to forgive me. He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I know that I can say like the song said that Sister Charles sung uh, uh, that, that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. He is the God of the bottom that does what, what no other can do. He's the God of the bottom because he meets me in my mess. But finally, he's the God of the bottom because he gives us a new beginning. What does God do when Moses becomes a fugitive and, and, and flees from justice? He can't go back to the palace. He can't go to, to Goshen because the Egyptian police are waiting on him right there. But God directs him to the desert. And somebody needs to understand that even though you might be in the desert this morning, God can still work in you in desert places. Here's a man who lived 40 years in the palace in the lap of luxury, but now a rock is his pillow. But there's always a blessing in the desert. <laughs> when, when we are in our proverbial valley, there is a blessing. Y'all know the song that Deacon Wright sings. There's joy in the valley. There's peace in the valley. He said you can find love in the valley. If you hold on long enough, God will show you what he's doing with you in the desert. First of all, when Moses, he gets to the desert, God raises up a mentor for him in the person of Jethro, who was the priest uh, of Midian. And God begins to, to use uh, Jethro to tell Moses some things to share the destiny that he has for him. And, and, and God showed him what he had in store for him. He learns what his true destiny is all about. Not only does God give him a mentor, but he he gives him a wife in the desert, Amen. a wife in the person of Sipporah, who was the daughter of Jethro. But then he gives him also a son and gives him a new family. The old family in, in Egypt is now gone, but he has a new family in the desert. In the desert, God, he gives him a mandate. And the mandate is simply this. Forget all of that Egyptian comfort. And I brought you into the desert because the clock of liberation has now struck and the purpose for which you are born has now been brought to pass. For the next 40 years, God, he prepares Moses on the backside of the desert. He prepares him to be the deliverer of the people in Egypt. Now that's a new beginning. Well, let me get ready to close. Back in the year of 2014, I went through the toughest time of my life, something worse than death, and that thing is called divorce. Yeah. I had been a Christian some 20 years, and I had been preaching for 17 years. Uh, Sister Ransom, I had been telling people what God can do for, for them and for them to trust them, him, even at their lowest point. But God was now putting me to the test. It was time for me to live out all that I had been telling others. I had to learn to shout and to trust and praise him at the bottom. Some of y'all, you shout because of comfort. You shout because of convenience. You shout because you got a new job. Uh, you shout because you got a new car. Uh, you shout because you got a new man or woman. But let me tell you something, that ain't a real shout. You ain't really shouted till you've been to hell and back. Uh, you ain't really got a shout until you've been to hell and come back and can talk about it. I went from the palace 
down to the desert and the Lord saw me through. I tried feeling sorry for myself, but the Lord gave me a mandate to come to Oklahoma, uh, to the Ebenezer Baptist Church. I was low. I was low and at the bottom, but God was and he is my refuge and underneath are his everlasting arms. In life, we're all going to have troubles, but we have to learn to be like that little boy that got separated from his mother at the mall. He was looking around for her and he couldn't find her. He got more and more afraid, and he began to cry. He cried and cried. Every time he looked around, all he could see were strangers. Everything looked so confusing. Sister Denise, he didn't know what he was going to do. Every store was packed. But he didn't have his mother. Well, suddenly out of nowhere, his mother, she found him and she picked him up. His eyes began to dry, not because his surroundings had changed, but because of whose arms he was now in. Well, you may be at the bottom today, but know that God is underneath it all. There is none like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you and I. He rides on the clouds in his majesty for the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. I want to tell somebody to just hold on. Hold on. Because he is the God of the bottom. Hold on because you ain't by yourself. You need to tell yourself greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You need to tell yourself no weapon formed against me shall prosper. He's able. He's able to pick you up out of your trouble. He's able to pick you up out of your trial. He's able to heal you. He's the God of the bottom. The lowest point you can get to. He's there. He's there. He's the God of the bottom. Shouting about all the wonderful good things in life, that's all right. But you got to learn to shout when you're down in the valley. You got to learn to shout your way out of your situation. It's easy to shout on the mountaintop. But you got to learn to shout at the bottom. And you're saying, preacher, but why would I shout at the bottom? You didn't hear what I've said all through the message. Because he is at the bottom. And you are safe in his arms. Safe. As the old preacher would say, so safe. You're safe in his arms. But if you've never trusted Jesus as Savior, you're not safe. Only the Christian is safe. I, 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 I don't care how it sounds, narrow-minded, I don't care. You are only safe if you're in Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you're not safe. You may look safe to everyone else. You might think you're safe, but the Christian, even in their mess, is safer than you. You must come by way of the cross. And when you do and when you find yourself at the bottom, Jesus is right there holding you up. As the song is sung, why don't you come?